please welcome Nathan Chandler Gibson. There you go. Wow. <laughs> that, that, really, that really hit. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, hey, so I, I'm Nathan Chandler Gibson. I'm a technical game designer from Sumo Digital in Newcastle. Um, oh, there, yeah. Woo! <laughs> uh, approaching three years now. Um, I'm glad to be here in Norway. It's been really great. You guys are lovely. Um, so I'm going to generally be talking over. Oh, clicker! There it is. <laughs> generally be talking about just uh, game design in general and how just to help communication. I'm doing a presentation called Something Blue. It's how to communicate ideas. Just to make sure everyone gets to the fun a lot quicker. How do I work this? Next. And this way. Ah, there we go. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so yes, before I actually picking up the technical game designer title, um, I started as a pixel artist under the alias uh, Level Two Select. Um, I did QA at Sega as well a couple of years back, um, and I know 2D uh, 2D pixel art to uh, a technical game design title is a very big jump. It's very complicated, but I promise there is actually a link here. Uh, so generally, just to kind of throw it back for a sec. Uh, so most of my goofy sprites I do just these goofy ideas, kind of bring them. Oh, fast! I wish I could move that fast. <laughs> would uh, generally be um, things that are inspired by beat-em-ups, uh, things like Streets of Rage, uh, RPGs that I played on my uncle's Commodore 64, if anyone knows what that is. Extremely rusty now. Um, but these are all the things that inspired me as a kid. Um, it was mostly likely due to the fact that there were four of us. Um, obviously, four siblings all find over the TV. It became an actual beat-up itself. It was really tricky. Um, so it was all find over the TV remote. I'd find uh, a place to spend my time elsewhere. So that would be sadly to my uncle's detriment. I'd hunt down his PC and then have my way of it. Um, but genuinely, that would then link me to, luckily, they got bored and tired of me hogging their hardware, and they'd be like, hey, please, please, just go, go away, go do something else. Um, they'd actually get an upgrade on their PC, and then say like, hey, here's, here's ours, just take the hardware, take the upgrade, do what you've got to do. And so they dropped me their hand-me-downs, which was awesome. I had my own chunky PC to play with. And this would be like, yeah, nine-year-old me would be like, oh my god, I can, I can do all these things, I can play with these games. Uh, yeah, no, that's not, not actually what happened. There's wrong. Okay, there's a catch here. My, my uncles decided to leave the PC with a hard, uh, the hardware itself with a CD with parting words rather than playing the game, make the game. So I was like, oh, what a, okay, okay, what does that even mean? I, I just wanted to play Metal Slug. I just wanted to kind of just relax and just play games on my own, just, just have fun with it. Um, but what he actually left me was a copy of Game Maker 6 um, in the 2003 version or so. Um, so obviously, luckily, over the time, I learned how to kind of like scrabble kind of ideas together, um, work with GML, Game Maker language, just like 2D things, basic coding language too. Just kind of had my own hand at these ideas and just kind of brainstorm. Uh, just things that inspired me. So obviously, with that in mind, uh, to beat them up that inspired me became this game. I actually can't remember what this one's called, Cranberry Clash. I think because I had like little blood kind of pop-ups and whatnot. It's terrible naming. Um, and obviously, other features that inspired me at the time, obviously, I do like party games as well. Trying to find things that just features such as uh, a combat score multiplier, loot drops from monsters, just like gear, R um, gear um, RNG as well. Just little things that I thought like, oh, it felt really good when I played uh, Fantasy Star. And that, um, the, obviously the, the enemy would drop this red drop, it'd be really rare. And that, that feeling felt really like that rush of excitement. So how can I get that in my projects as well? Um, so these tests, obviously, they, as you can see, specifically the one on the left as well, it was, it was very much just like black and white, just trying to throw things together. How do I get this idea out so I can kind of just get people excited about the things I'm excited, excited about as well? I'd, I'd go online, I'd go onto websites such as uh, Sprite's resource, which is really handy to see just like these are people that's actually taking the game apart and found the files and how do you make it from there. I'd grab some background, some characters, some, a song or two from YouTube. Um, and after some time passed, when I actually generally thought, OK, I've got something here. This is actually starting to feel pretty sweet. My characters are moving pretty, pretty funky. Got nice, chunky letters. Let me, let me pass it to people so they can just play. I, I kind of want to get their feedback on this, this that level up system I kind of brainstormed, or some party mechanics and such. Um, just let me know what you think. And it was awesome. It was great. Um, generally, it then led to some things I didn't expect, however, where before they actually would play the game, they would just pick up the pad and pause and be like, oh, hey, that's, uh, that's that. That's the fighting sound effects from this game. And uh, hey, that's uh, some icons from this game. I'm like, oh, huh. Even before they even played my game, any of my ideas, all these crazy things I want to dive into, I got, like a spreadsheet of things I just want to throw at them. They've already, I've already conditioned them to think and play it a certain way. Um, and it was around this time where I actually became extremely hyper aware of how first impressions are when selling a concept. Um, you only really get one chance when it comes to selling a concept, establishing the core, depiction the frame. So you've got to pick your battle very, very wisely when diving in, when selling your idea to someone. Um, so yes, a lot, a lot of thinking happened during that phase. 
So with that in mind, I then started looking more towards, okay, well, I want to just get these ideas out to people. Uh, what can I do? If I start again, start from scratch, how can I do it? Maybe I don't have to start from scratch. Maybe with the skills I've picked up from just looking at game maker and these tile sets and sprites I've, I've looked at, I can start making art kits, uh, code extension packs, so I can just compartmentalize those previous ideas or previous things that clearly had something to them, but may have just hit, missed them slightly and start rebuilding them and kind of working way up. So I, I just kind of make little chunks, modular sets. So if I start a new project so I can picture someone, it's an easy in and easy up and easy get to get, get to the straight idea, get going. Um, so it's more focused on, at this point, I can just start designing and talking more to people, not so much like, oh, how do I make that guy jump again? It's like X and Y, I don't know. My math is terrible, by the way. Um, so we can just discuss live ideas with people. Um, so yes, jumping straight to the core pillars and the gameplay loop, the USP, just encouraging brainstorming with people quickly. Don't feel held back by the code itself just at this point. Um, which is awesome. So in turn, it kind of led to some interesting setups where my siblings, who finally got tired of the TV, was like, oh, hey, what's going on over here? And they'll just realize I'm kind of I'm tinkering away in the PC, messing around with stuff. They'll be like, hi, I kind of want to make an idea now as well. How can I get started? And I could just pass them my ideas, and then they add to that kit to make, what did I call this? Hey, new pitch for adventure game Final Final PNG. Well, that's an artist name. Um, <laughs> so with that in mind, these, these ideas can be brainstormed really quickly. I can pass them my files, I can pass them to modular kits, and they can just start brainstorming the ideas. And then we can just start talking about, okay, I don't, I don't, they don't need to kind of figure out too much of the code. They can just start talking to me about what ideas they have, what, what things they want to bring to the table and fantasies. And it was, it's brilliant. You end up making a, a game mechanics library that way. Um, so kind of jumping into a field a few years, obviously this kind of mindset of like trying to build small pieces so you can get straight to the point of your, of your, your gameplay designs and such. Um, it carried over to uh, Teesside University, which is great. Um, obviously we'd have a lot more of a proactive kind of understanding of the needs and specialties of systems. I'm, I'm learning 3D at this point, so I know like uh, animators be using 3DS Max and such and just trying to figure out how do we all tie these libraries together because everyone's going to need different things when it comes to a bigger team. Um, but I think what was more important at this point is I then realized that there's actual really big different needs for the people themselves. Obviously, I'm not, I'm not pitching to my sibling or my cousin anymore. I'm, I'm discussing with people from all over the world, which is amazing, as, as we all hear actually right now in Norway. Um, so it's a great opportunity to work with people from different backgrounds across the UK and overseas. Um, once again, it kind of eased me directly into the topic of how do I get these ideas to people quickly and cheaply? Understand there's, like a, a, there's language barriers, age barriers, uh, and more. So like how can I get these things to people so we all just feel engaged, we can just discuss together? Um, Especially me as a designer who generally I, I stutter quite a lot. I, I kind of pause as you'll see as I go through. So generally when it comes to this, and also being from London, and then obviously I went up to the north, accents are a thing, which became very apparent, like, oh, hey, God, no, no it's, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> so just that kind of thing to make people feel more comfortable when I'm just jumping straight in, um, which kind of brings me more towards the present day. Ooh, it's moving. Uh, there we go. Um, so yes, I, I joined Sumo. I joined Sumo Digital, where a family of uh, uh, studios are from across the globe. We have various entries. Obviously, we've done things, as you may have seen previously. Um, beloved IPs such as Sackboy, a big, um, a big Adventure, Team Sonic Racing, daring IPs into new feats, such as when we looked at Snake Pass, IDA, you know, on that side of things. And then recently, things I, I, I joined when I, when I worked on as well would be Hood Outlaws and Legends, this, this little guy in the corner. Um, uh, due to the range of projects, obviously we can work amazingly alongside a great variety of staff and clients from, from numerous locations overseas. So yeah, I joined Hood when it was in mid-development. Um, so for context, uh, just in case you haven't seen it before, um, it is the most recent title from uh, Sumo Newcastle up north in, in the UK, northeast. Uh, it's published by Focus Interactive in France. Um, it's a stealth multiplayer PvPVE game, ooh, a lot of Ps, um, where two teams of thieves, go, yeah, <laughs> two teams of thieves compete to outwit one, uh, one another, trying to claim the treasure and avoiding the state, or die trying at least. Um, with that in mind, I actually joined directly as, obviously my title right now is a technical game designer. I joined as a gameplay designer at the time. So we'd be trying to figure out when I first joined, like how can I help characters' perks kind of blend together nicely. Um, just the general day-to-day -day of design is being looking at the standard stuff, like you know, play test data when people kind of just jump around and figuring things out, balancing perks and such as I just mentioned. And the, the long, dreadful, but really, really important looking at and writing up game design documents, GDDs, just decks to kind of let people know, like, these are our findings, these are our thoughts, let's, let's build this together. Um, generally trying to be on a hunt for creative solutions for things. Um, and as anyone who's done any uh, design and concept and knows, having everyone with different backgrounds and histories and experiences, even the most amazing GDD, the most amazing game design doc, 
it's still really hard to sell and get your ideas to come across in different areas. I, I have an actual, a, a basic example here, which is actually from our game talk we had at one point, where we, have, we had a character who's basically you're throwing a grenade, and that grenade kind of slows people down, but you want it to be kind of like, so you become heavy, kind of like you're moving on some sort of like tar sort of thing. Um, obviously, to me, a, a clean example would just be Splatoon, where generally like you're covered in ink, you get the screen for now, so you get the, 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 the harsh feedback, and your characters actually start animating to go with it, so you've got a lot of different feedback layers there, which is great. But obviously, in terms of kind of going for something more, more serious, in tone, and in that kind of tone and nature, generally going towards uh, Call of Duty would help people get onto the idea a lot quicker. But it's the thing where, okay, well, we've got the screen for now, and then the kind of hazard mark, because that will help you in that kind of mark. But just the general secondary and tertiary feedback when it comes into the animation kit, which we need to pass to our teams. We need to pass this to the animators actually doing the full body or sub um, body animations, and the coders who's actually going to stitch this all up for us. They kind of need to know what we're working with. So. Taking damage when uh, damage covering you when with splatter as it slows your movement could easily be solved in one thing, but we need to then consider each department as we kind of go for these things. Generally, when it comes to these pillars, we're trying to make sure we're not throwing people too far off, essentially. Um, so yes, that would then go into our, our game design docs, making sure we have to create videos and just trying to make sure, okay, we have a game design doc, we have videos and references to make sure people know, like, okay, this is cool, I get the idea. But sometimes even that isn't enough. So with that in mind, oops, lagging again, there we go. Um, what I then realized as I was kind of going through these things, trying to brainstorm these ideas with people and showcase uh, examples, kind of get this to come across, like, yeah, let's get this in, it'll be great. What I didn't realize was, when it came to the way I started pitching ideas to people, a lot of my time due to just the kits I was building and the design proposals, I would be very visual-led. I would then look at exploring the engine directly. So this would be through Blueprint. Yes, I have an idea, which I can show for a link, but I'd actually just get my hands out, jump an engine, I would start making just quick quick um, uh, versions of these ideas to get my idea across, even if it's a basic white box, a basic, just a mannequin UE4, just kind of running around. Um, so generally just to show the idea what I was kind of giving to people, and I've noticed that during this, because some of these ideas were explored and people can just pick up the pad, anything that was a lot more obscure at the time became easy to understand and digest, it made a lot more sense. Um, so then rather than slowly just kind of really going through some game design documents, just discussing with people in, in these positions, such as animation stuff, how we can just brainstorm this idea quickly, having these kits just kind of sped up the process, which is really great. We can then discuss more about the actual pipeline itself. So during this moment, I actually started considering, OK, I'm doing my, my game design documents. I'm discussing the ideas. and breaking it down with production. Now I'm kind of being hands-on. What is this title? It's getting complicated. Um, so this is where I started exploring just the era in terms of like game design towards technical game design, um, which then goes to a question being, I've been asked a few times, what does technical game design actually mean in a team and how it differs, uh, differs from other roles? Um, it's actually gone into a lot of questions to do with like hierarchy and, and general the title itself. Um, with that in mind, obviously, this completely differs between a, a, an indie studio or solo developer versus someone who's obviously working in a, in a larger AAA studio, say like 300 plus people. Um, so generally, honestly, I'll be honest, it's hard to tell you. Um, Newcastle itself, we're actually still trying to figure it out. It's something new that we actually brought into our, into our, our setup. Um, generally, as we've gone through searches over the years as well, it's extremely loosely defined. It differs from person to person, and as I said before, the needs of the project too. As I said, a smaller team could be more hands-on, while a large team may have more specialists that you can refer to. Um, in terms of our, our Sumo Newcastle office, obviously we have uh, strike teams. So we generally have like each, each designer would be with an animator, with an audio technician, with, with engineers, we all kind of brainstorm it together. And that could be different areas such as we have like our combat team or just generally like our, our level design team environments and mission exploration. Um, and that way you generally know who you can kind of just quickly like bounce ideas off generally as you discuss your, 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 your great your brainstorm, your great idea. Um, I think the strike teams, you could also see this as, as brain trusts, which is from uh, Edwin Catmull, I believe, um, generally from Pixar. People just need, people will know what's going on quicker because you're keeping everyone in the loop. You're not having one team in one complete different department sketching ideas up and drafting things and then have to go across the hall to pass it to another team and it can, things can get lost in translation that way. Um, and I think what's the main thing here that we've actually discovered as well is it generally just kind of keeps people feeling involved, especially in a, in a world where obviously we had... Um, we had lockdown, obviously. Everyone's now working hybrid, working remote. Um, there'll be a case where there's a lot of people now just essentially, you may not actually see them straight away in the workplace. Obviously, everyone's still putting in and being amazing. But with, obviously, their avatars as well, you may not see them immediately. So you just want to make sure everyone still feels involved, everyone's voice is heard, um, regardless of what disciplines or what titles they're in. And this specifically, I think, really helped for our gameplay and, and, and code disciplines as well. Um, 
to go into detail, I think the kind of link between the code and design disciplines is for, for a technical designer is we're able to kind of communicate our ideas a lot quicker without having to pause, as I said before, to write up too many things. We can get straight into discussion. What happens, what's helpful with a technical designer, I think, as well, is you can genuinely have, OK, if you have our, our specialist designer who's actually kind of more focused on, hey, this is the things I'm looking at, the research I got, and the coders are kind of starting to think, figure out ways to piece it together, a technical designer may actually have a, a broader, a, a wider experience and idea of how these two systems can work together, and as I, I mentioned earlier, how to modulate those so we can kind of prepare for future work, so we can save time production-wise as well. Um, just to aid in discussions, we can keep pushing forward. Um, so more of a communicator between the disciplines itself. Um, it could also be an explorer of the systems itself and the tools. Um, so generally, helping to avoid waste time, as I mentioned before, when stepping into the unknown. Um, obviously, if it comes into, like, okay, one of the things you may not want to do too much when you're on a live project because risky is to move from U4 to U5. Maybe having a strike team dedicated to that and a technical designer realize, okay, what, is, what does this team need? What, is, um, what does this group need? And then how do we kind of figure out, is moving forward into a new engine the best experience we can do right now is, is a great way as well, just exploring the systems. And last but not least, we have obviously the maintainer of standards and practices. And this would be generally optimizing your pipelines. Obviously, if someone's kind of mocking things up just to showcase people, they may be looking into blueprints and setting up their own folder, folder directories. Trying to make sure if we're obviously bringing these kind of things to the table, you don't want to make uh, anything harder for other people. So just making sure someone knows, like, to someone to refer to what would be the best structure for this, for this collaborative workflow. And as I mentioned, it's going all wiggly now. There we go. Um, these are just pure examples. These aren't um, the, the, the direct rules of what to do if you are doing this kind of uh, hybrid work setup or a technical designer role. This is not one shoe fits all. And I think it's just something you as a studio can explore to see what works better in terms of either specialist or multidiscipline. Um, obviously, me and my youth, as I mentioned before, it's, I was mainly looking into exploring tools and how to modulate general uh, ideas and systems so people can just pick up and play, just jump straight in. Um, kind of similar to things you'd see in like uh, other engines such as RPG Maker would have presets, just things I can just give to people so they can discuss. Um, and I think with this as well, then you can then start looking into just how we can aid colleagues streamlining the bloat so we can just all kind of start moving forward and just get to the fun a lot quicker. Um, and yes, in an industry obviously where a lot of changes may come out of the blue, obviously you're kind of running on a sprint, obviously trying to make sure your game's getting out the door in time, things may change. This can actually see, you can see a technical designer as well as a shield, someone who's generally trying to make sure if something's coming out of place, they have a, a global overview as all the different roles that I mentioned. They can help communications and make sure the teams come together. Um, reducing any user error, uh, error where you can. Um, and it'll, I think what's really handy specifically for me, someone who, who stutters and such as well, um, when it comes to feature sign-offs, making sure your, your game design document and you, your, your signing of the documents to itself to say, yes, this is what we're going forward with, isn't just uh, hard copy material in terms of like paper and pencil and such. It's something that you can actually keep with the project itself and show, hey, you have this document, this video, it may be a little bit draining to sit through, and no one wants to sit through like a, a Word doc with just like pages upon pages of words. In this case, you don't want to mislead people. So here's a little, little corner, a little playable snippet that kind of can come with it as well. And generally, it just helps people kind of get more pad in hand, brainstorms, discussions. I can talk to you about what you think of the game. I can talk to you what you think of this new level. I just put the pad in your hand and we can discuss before we have to go into a full-on investment of cost as well. Um, generally helping us get to through a topic and, yeah, reach the fun part quicker. Everyone just wants to start making the game as well. Uh, so with that in mind, I've collected two examples of how we can start brainstorming and communicating across teams and disciplines quickly. Um, ways how Blueprint, for example, helped us get our ideas across when things may have seemed a little bit tricky or when things may have slowed down in Hoods, Outlaws, and Legends when we were trying to make sure we had our, our team all together just to get the thing over the line. Um, but I want to have some fun of it. I've also realized that this may not translate too well since this is from a, 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 a saying from, from Britain, from the UK. Um, so I'll, I'll see how this works. Just bear with me. Um, to explore this, I'm going to see how we're going to look into how we married our teams together. So I've taken these, these snippets of examples and I've framed them into four main areas. So we have something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue. And that would be, I had a chocolate. Yes. <laughs> Get in there. <laughs> so that would be generally the restrictions placed upon us. Obviously, we want to bring a new idea. These are something that we had originally. How can we make sure we're not going too far of our remit. We want to make sure we understand what we're working with here. We want to bring a new idea to the team. We want to understand the actual outcome we want to change. So obviously, this has come from somewhere, be it higher up amongst the team and our strike team. We generally are like, hey, that level is really cool, but wouldn't this be awesome? Wouldn't we add this too? OK, what's the idea we actually want to The simplest, breaking it down, what's the simplest thing we want to add to it? What's something new? Um, in terms of borrowed, OK, we, again, we're working within costs, within times and such. We don't want to cause too much stress and headaches for people when you're like, hey, this is our idea. Go, and then they're all like, OK, that's, that's a lot of work. 
So how do we all deal with these ideas while borrowing systems we already have or just kind of working around these kind of things to make sure we're not causing too much bloat? And something blue. So generally, obviously, it doesn't have to be a blueprint. It could be any kind of package. But generally, how can we just be hands-on to kind of get something visual out to kind of brainstorm with people for our, to guide and help our design discussions itself? So, and hopefully, as I kind of go through these examples with just four points, you see how we took these features down the L. So first up, the onboarding sequence. So this would be our co-op star, uh, well, our solo co-op star story mission that we went for. In Hood Outlaws and Legends, obviously, we started with uh, a sequence where you'd essentially want to jump into a heist to make sure you actually feel part of a bigger mission. But it didn't start like that originally. We, we started with something small, something simple in a sandbox, more akin to Mario 64. You have Peach's Castle. You start here, and you get to that location while just kind of knocking down some walls and stuff, just kind of making sure it feels fun to play before I actually get myself, like, jump into a full match. Um, the sandbox hub was mainly for quick learning, so you'd have something for each class and character to aid you in the right direction. With our, like, a big brawn kind of character, our strong character, would be something that you can kind of break down. With more of a nimble character, it's like kind of making sure that there is a bush or something you kind of can hide and stealth through because we want to make sure players know the, the versatility of their kit. Um, so yeah, you can see the actual the hub area as well kind of spread out. Um, so this was our, our, our first example when we started looking into it, obviously preparing like little pop-ups as the characters kind of walk through the, the teaching prompts. So instead of just being a basic hub, we had a little obstacle course to let you know, like, hey, you can jump over here, you can crouch underneath this. Anything that would also help guide discussions for any pop-ups that would come with concept art as well in the future. So kind of starting to look into that area first and foremost, just a basic pathway. Um, so this was what we started with, something old. Um, we also explored, does that go through? Uh, there we go. We also kind of explored in terms of this old stuff as well, the flavor that we're going to be dealing with. Um, obviously, this is kind of nearing later production where we actually have most of the teams focus on the live game itself, the live bands that, that we're about to ship. So we wanted to figure out, okay, and it comes to just onboarding people to feel confident and they actually want to enjoy and indulge in this world, how do we set the scene? So we ended up looking into to different audio snippets. So I think this is a case that kind of eased down with a camera to kind of set the mood. And we was looking at audio such as like the Dark Souls um, hub theme where you had the bonfire. And I think we used Hades' audio, like a few tales, tales of Hades, just kind of, kind of set the tone. And I think this first test, which was just, again, once again, just thrown an engine and videos and pads, just let people feel it, but just so you can feel out, hey, so this is a basic starting point, just kind of ease you into the game. Um, but when we say the story uh, environment, the feel and the vibe, is this what we're talking about? Is that the right direction? Let's, let's kind of discuss more. So that was like a, an, an uh, original point we started with. Um, but breaking that down, we then discussed, OK, here's a, here's a checklist of the things we want to explore further. So moving on to something new, these new items would be, OK, what teaching prompts can we change so a lot more clean as seen in that kind of mock-up image we have here as well? Um, how can we explore not just the actual flavor, which so far, OK, that's looking great, but you're on your own. It's a, it's a team game. It's a co-op game. It's, generally trying to make sure you feel like you're part of a squad and you're actually doing a heist, not just a basic obstacle course around the map. So we need to showcase the teamwork more, and we need to showcase the actual heist itself. So with this in mind, we kind of went back to the drawing board and started thinking about, OK, let's look at what we can do with these. Oop, going through. And kind of focus on those last two points. Our initial point, as we mentioned before, we already have the flavor. We already know what kind of video we want to go for, or like a voiceover to kind of set the scene. In terms of actually being in a heist environment and the setting flavor itself, we realized maybe not, don't, don't put it in a hub because it'll feel like too, too bare bones. We already have this luscious map from our multiplayer game already that people are playing. Let's actually just start looking at this map as a mission as well. Also, it kind of makes the world feel bigger when you can use it for multiple purposes, not just one, one kind of corner. So generally, I think the challenge would be, as we was doing this, we also was restricted by Playgo, I believe, um, on the PlayStation system, trying to make sure if the player is going to be offline while obviously downloading uh, the extra files, how can they still play this mission? So they can't, there's no co-op here. You can't do it like a co-op tutorial or anything. You're on solo play. Co-ops, uh, any AI companion with that in mind is also going to be completely out the window because we are obviously we're still punching above our weight. We only at this point, I think we had like four animators as well. Um, so our team, even though we're obviously in uh, double A in flavor, we're still punching up. We're punching above our weight to try and make sure we know what kind of like quality we can get. But we don't want to half-ass things. We want to make sure it's still the best experience we can offer people. Um, so the questions became a little bit clearer, I think. Generally, in regards to those last two points, it became generally looking at, OK, we have these co-op actions. How can we still maintain that heist feeling before you actually go into a full-on heist? And generally, it's something the team, that wanted, the team itself wanted to explore. Every, every department and every other strike team was trying to figure out, OK, what can we do with these kind of setups without needing to then go too far into, like, OK, if we're going to have if we were to have people move around in the background to kind of stage something, that's obviously more more mocap time. We only really had one shot to get our, our full mocap list, so we can't really keep going back into that area. What can we work with? Um, 
so yes, we, we obviously we brainstorm what can we provide for the studio so we can make sure we can get that satisfying onboarding open experience where people can just jump into the game itself. Um, one of the things we actually jumped straight into to explore was just the engine itself. We started seeing what tools was available, and we noticed that Sequencer itself could actually be used to just take previous gameplay recordings and kind of manipulate it in a different direction. So obviously, at the same time, we're doing QA playtests. People are kind of messing around with the game as well. Um, just people are trying to figure out some, uh, obviously, we're doing perks and balancing at the same time. While we're doing this, why don't we just record our session? So you know, we've got our, our monk, the bold guy, uh, Tuck. Obviously, he's done the mission. He's kind of picking up the treasure chest. He's bringing it to the winch. Why don't we just record that? And then it's almost like a role play where we can kind of reestablish those beats in the mission itself to kind of fill the environment with Li like livable, breathable characters, make them feel more alive. Um, generally, this will obviously be just trying to borrow the kit we have at the moment to so see if this is the direction we want to go. Let's, we know for a fact doing AI is too much and all those kind of things are out the window, but people really want it. What can we work with? So this was our first test we kind of looked into. It was a good launch point just to make sure we know some sort of co-op is definitely desired and it kind of hyped people up to be like, yes, okay, this is possible. There's something here. How can, how can, we, how can we bring this to the table now? Um, so people started to feel a little bit more confident between working within our means and obviously, at the same time, the level designers are actually looking at a, a mission kit to make sure everything kind of ties nicely together. So while I see we are document, documenting our work and our findings, how can we do our, our, our missions as well with this current kit we've discovered? So what we did, we then obviously go back towards our level designers who's doing the mission at the moment. So obviously, we are, we're back in the graveyard, where we currently have Hood, who was, he climbed up a tower, and he got to top and looked over, and then he jumped down for some reason, which is very out of place for him, since he's actually a sniper cat. He, he wants to stay up above. He wants to stay over view. And it kind of gives you that sense of, OK, this is his, his role, his direction, where he wants to play. By making him jump down, we don't want to mislead players to think you want to play as a sniper too low to the ground. It's kind of misleading people. So to reframe that with the test that we just discovered and the things that we've just looked into, we just reframed it with having him mark a nearby enemy with the objective itself, the key to the treasure. And then we'd use our sequencer tests to just pull the camera out, as we saw in our first test with the Hades audio, and then use our automated tested the role play cats we have to kind of sweep a character in, do the blade, and then kind of set you into scene. So it kind of gives you an idea, a small taste of what our cats can do up front before they actually are given to the player to jump straight in. Um, naturally, by using our mission sequencer that our uh, level designers were looking at as well, we can easily kind of tie all these things together. So with the objective prompts, we had obviously Hood climb to the top, uh, Robin Hood climb to the top of the tower, and then instead of just jumping down, just that trigger itself would move up between areas. We can also use the system for our checkpoint system. So if the player was to die at any point, they can just get back straight into the action. So all these things are piecing together really nicely. Uh, so yes, we cleared out the experience in the heist escape a lot better, I think, at that point. It started to look more feasible. Generally, we know how we can actually do the phases now. It's not just one guy, one man team doing everything on his own. It is, we are a team, we are a squad. But we didn't quite showcase the actual teamwork itself. They are working independently, which is great. It shows that even though they are on different scales, and different levels, they're all part of the game, they're all contributing to the greater, the greater match. But in terms of actually being with your ally, it's something we can push just a little bit more, I think. It's generally trying to figure out what else could we do when the rest of the departments and teams start asking the obvious questions. Hey, here's my idea. Yeah, but what about, uh, what about when you heal? This, we've got a lot of healing actions in this. Or obviously we've got, when it comes to takedowns as well, can we kind of show how co-op takedowns could work? Anything that we can experience, show the experience to the player up front so they get hyped to want to try these things out further on with groups of friends. Um, so yes, these would be a good solid start for our, our, our testing ground, but we still need to kind of check out those edge cases so we can make sure when we actually start developing the actual, pro the actual material itself, the team knows what's the limit we can push and have, well, if there's any other way to push around it even. Um, so to help frame the healing, for example, we simply had our, our, our role-playing Marianne, the assassin character, have a little tag over her head. So this would mean discussing with the UI team and the programming teams, like, how easy is it to get basic tags? Can we just have a, a little prompt that shows that they've taken damage? Maybe play an audio singer to say, like, hey, um, I need healing. And then with that point, you can generally just have our cat kind of just follow, like, it's an actual, like, uh, an RPG party, essentially. Um, with that in mind, that helps obviously keep the conversations up, just letting people know what we're looking into, what we're investigating, what kind of brainstorms we can do. But again, not just as bullet points, just actually something visible so they can see what we're trying to get towards. Um, and this obviously is further as well. The melee catch will be a lot harder because we're not going to have a full-on AI melee system. So in this case, we obviously kept the melee guys busy while you played to help extract. But as you saw at the top, Robin actually shot a bow, uh, his uh, Billy um, bolt, at the sheriff, which kind of shows that there's a lot more Team Sinji at play here. It's not just you and your own. If this was the old version, Robin would have simply just shot 
jumps down and kind of just start winching. So it kind of makes sure everyone still feels like they're part of a greater play here, a greater team. And ultimately, they are a group. They are a squad trying to uh, escape here. Everyone's key. Ooh, there we go. So yes, we were able to do some findings. And we was able to find out, obviously, where was we exploring the Unreal functions. Um, people was able to aid each other. We was able to aid each other's disciplines. We can discuss our goals quicker and swifter, um, and actually just give these playable snippets to people. So instead of just having a long shopping list of uh, requirements, with a small strike team, we were just able to kind of brainstorm and make something quick and be like, "Let's know your thoughts. Let's move forward from this. Let's see how we can change it. We can iterate from here, and, and then we can start actually costing and iterating and cleaning up the code properly to actually make something for our game itself, um, using the, the 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 mission layout from the level designers." Um, and obviously from here, obviously we discuss further like what we can do, can we clean up any further, so we'd need some new hooks, what would be the cost for actually having more of these, these if anything, the role plays kind of cleaned up and the UI, as I mentioned before, et cetera. And that would be a good place to sign, sign this one off, I think. No, actually there's a, there's a little bit more. There's a little bit more to kind of clean up this mess. So with this in mind, obviously now we have our prototype. We need to know when to turn this prototype into an actual dedicated system. I think just in terms of how these, we uh, these wedding illusions have gone so far with all the blue stuff, the goal here is not to just mess around with the blueprints. The goal is to unite your team, not get married to the prototype. So once your prototype has proven itself, you need to make sure you know how to strip it down. So this obviously goes back to thinking modeling in terms of pieces of where everyone kind of jumps in. Um, so you can make an actual dedicated system for the team. Um, obviously, as, as you're finding ways to motivate your team, you want to make sure you're not actually overwhelming or it's becoming to the detriment of others. Yeah, this, this idea is amazing, but if you consider the cost of it, let's make sure those conversations are happening as we brainstorm these things. Keep everyone in the loop. Um, what you don't want is for these prototypes to be really fun, but then behind the scenes, you've got crazy spaghetti codes that's just running amok, and it's going to kind of make things really hard for people. They're not going to like you for that, trust me. So... Keep communications open. Make sure you don't give it a heart attack. Keep everyone in the loop of what you're doing and brainstorm these things with intention. Um, and yes, and that, as I mentioned before, this can then be further pushed by making sure you're using temporary components, branches such as in Perforce, just to make sure your files are segmented in the right way it needs to be, developer folders, and just clarifying what is specifically temporary by your actual, for example, in your blueprints, making sure it's noted up where it can either be detached or reattached. So everyone knows where these things are possible just to jump in and jump out. And I think I have another example here when it comes to our post-launch character. So everything so far is lit as was coming to actually launch in the game. So in this edge case, we have a, a, obviously the game's now been out. We've moved through season one. And we're trying to make sure, obviously, now with the players, we know what kind of things they want to test and what things they want to mess around with. Going on to a new hero would be interesting. Obviously, standard how you have, obviously, like in Overwatch or MOBAs, you're trying to bring a new hero to the conversation. Metas go real crazy, real quick. So in this edge case, we need to bring our new hero to, to the game, being Ada. The question would be, now we are post-launch, trying to figure out when we have these metas and obviously doing these play tests. We already have our four mainstays. We have John the Brawler, Marianne um, in our assassin role, Tuck the Mystic who can heal, and our sniper elite being Robin Hood himself. Where would our next slot obviously come in for this? How can we start brainstorming this while everyone at this point, obviously, we may be looking at other projects, but specifically, we are now a live game. It's not simply pencils down, or obviously that little brushing at the end. It's still going. We're having live feedback from people, getting live bugs to fix. We've got to keep iterating. It's also a competitive game. It needs to be as polished as possible. So adding a new character is going to be a real tricky one, especially with our team, again, being not, not a, a larger AAA studio. How can we make sure we can make sure people are on the ball when it comes to discussing live balancing as well as adding new content in? So looking on to, obviously, something new, branching off those four older characters, we obviously need to then discuss, obviously, again, half the team's looking at things like cross-play and such as well. How do you bring a fourth character in? So we looked at statistics, obviously, to start off again. This would just be your standard game design setup. What, what are things that people are saying? What things they want to test and play with? Um, what can we do to re-energize this hostile, competitive environment? Um, so this would be, obviously, further looking into the play space. So this would be like, okay, we haven't got so many characters that can actually barricade a door like you'd see in Tom Clancy's Siege and such. Maybe that would be a good idea. Um, brainstorming things like, okay, well... This game is stealth first and foremost, but obviously we do have two melee characters, but we don't want it to always just be obviously looking at things like Dark Souls, but in this edge case, ours is stealth first and foremost. We don't want our melee to always be lock on and kind of spam, stamina away. It's, it doesn't want to be too one note, so let's see if there's a way we can add an additional layer to the combat if there's any way. So that's the second thing we want to talk about. Um, a third thing would be obviously we have ultimates in the game, so obviously we have our healing and our invisibility. When it comes to someone who can, say, do like a, a grenade throw, or it's like the explosive shot that you saw that Robin with the blue arrow shot, 
there isn't actually a way to kind of counter that. How can you counter that and have a clean getaway? We're having all these different types of discussions in terms of what the heroes can do, but how do you want to make sure, as we're adding a new character in, there's clear counterplays to them? Um, so yes, we have our, obviously our initial design discussions and start brainstorming what we can introduce to the table, and then we start bringing our notes together for Ada, the Cell Sword, which will be our fifth character. So Ada would be our area control character first and foremost. We start brainstorming how you can shift between offensive and evasive play. So obviously, if you somehow got caught and you need to get away, can you get away in time? Can you evade someone coming at you and get them to sleek back into the shadows? Or if you are in combat and it's literally your back is against the wall, well, what do you do here? Can you actually stand for yourself? And it's trying to make sure those two kind of notes actually feel satisfying in this kind of setup where you're always on the kind of the back and forth between uh, combat and stealth. Um, so we were looking to things like being able to like dodge and parry. So it's trying to figure out like, okay, we're going to mix some things where if only at the moment melee characters can actually block and uh, range characters can evade, if this character wanted to do a type of uh, dodge and parry follow-up, what would that be? So that would be, okay, we're looking into mixing some character abilities together, something we need to explore. Um, adding a, a dynamic combat layer, if they're doing follow-ups, like how far does your combos actually go? So it would be like a set of a standard free hit. Maybe you do a double back step for something else is pressed. So this would be looking at things like fighting games. We have multiple tertiary layers to make sure one character's kit has a variety of um, ways around it. Um, and obviously, as I mentioned before, trying to figure out the area control, can we block doors? Can we make sure if I have a point, so in this edge case, we use capture points, little glowy areas to let you know, like, if I died, I can respawn here. How can we make sure we keep people out? It's very easy to get in this game, because originally was thinking mainly against, obviously, AI na uh, navigating, management. But in this edge case, sometimes you want to make sure you can just, if you block the player out, maybe there's a trip line, something to let you know that something's coming. Something so you can add more comms to your co-op setup. So yes, back to the drawing board. Thinking again, little face in the corner. What is new? What can we do to make our hit new hero with these new complete fighting systems quickly? And then how can we make the actual combat feel dynamic when you can't avoid it? So this would be blocking people away to protect your base and such. Um, so yes, we, as I mentioned before, we started looking into the borrowing section. So what can we borrow from our current kit? So we, have, we want mix abilities and a dynamic combat layer. Obviously, when it comes to um, John at the top, he has the sledgehammer. He is more of a powerful solo kind of combatant. You can rely on him to kind of hold the gate up with, with, on his own as you rush through, kind of take down heavier armored foes at, with ease while you can't quite snipe them. While Tuck at the bottom with the flower, the healing guy, he can obviously do a wider sweep in case there's needing some, some crowd control in that way. Um, so finding a nice way between those two would be a good start. So that would be a question of, okay, we already have two good, um, good starting points. The game is live. People can play test these at the moment. They can play these at the moment. We know how people use and abuse in terms of like obviously game matters as well, both roles, how can we try to fix these characters at the same time while learning how we can apply their, their setup onto a new character? So back to the blueprinting side. Here, obviously, again, as I mentioned before, we only got one mocap mo sheet, so we need to be very smart with this kind of setup. So I think our initial test was just something real basic blueprints-wise. We asked the code instance if this is okay, and just a, a basic function so we can just plug out one moveset and plug in another one, essentially like a quick character select. And our first thing we tried was, essentially, you were more of a sturdy cat with a shield on your back. And then once you put the shield down, looking into um, area denial, we then looked into, okay, now you put the shield down, you are more nimble and fluent. So this would be changing your equipment, just discussing more, more layers, like what can work, what doesn't work. A lot of these things didn't actually go through to the final game, but I was just trying to figure out, I could, I could sell these things to people. I can, I can throw up a video of, of Tom Clancy's seed and say, this shield person is amazing, somebody you can kind of duck behind and such. But obviously, that wouldn't take it into their direct accounts of how their metrics scale to ours. We can, we can bring that data over, but I can also bring it over and just give you the game pad and say, how does this feel? This is kind of taking notes from A and B. How about we make C out of it? Um, so yes, it was just trying to figure out when we have those things where it's like, would these inputs change in different ways? Obviously, this input would be mainly putting a, a shield down. There could be other things we can do. So this is actually part of the design conversation. This is only one example in a grand thing, a set of um, directions we could take it. We can take it where maybe the actual the, the swing of the heavy and the action uh, from the heavy to light attacks is more of an input direction. So maybe the backflip is when you press back an attack versus forward to lunge. Um, so this will help with our animator talks, just feeling it out and changing the inputs real quick. Just plug a controller in, change the event that triggers it, and just let people just discuss as a group. Um, and yes, it also goes into the barricade as well. Obviously, the barricade being the wall, it's like trying to figure out, if I put this down, how do I work with the gear sets as well? So it's not just my, my action itself, it's the gear which I find in the map as well. How does that change my character? 
Um, and we made a nice little move list, like a nice little combo deck that you'd probably see, obviously, again, in a fighting game, trying to figure out, OK, if we look at our costs here, these are the things that we we're working with at the moment. How does it kind of bounce on top of those? Extra frames, less frames, basic timings and metrics to kind of start us up so we can discuss and also just see and feel it. How does it actually feel, game flow being the main focus here for our idea generation? Um, trying to get rid of any headaches where we can for people. Oh, missed slide there. There we go. Um, oh, this one's not playing. I'll try that once more. So I'll go back. And forward. There we go. So yes, that would ultimately then become our, our moves that we then look into, where it's like, OK, we know we want these kind of dynamic actions from this character. Now we can start blending into the actual movements itself. Ask the animator from the shopping list once we start looking into. We do want it to be, if you dodge back, they can then counter with a slash. We already know how it feels. We already know that if it feels great as part of this combat kit. We can actually pass the shopping list to people and be like, yes, this is what we're actually looking for. We didn't need to rely too much on just the, the paper itself. Um, so yes. Evading and punishing. That's something that actually was really, really enjoyed amongst the team where we're just trying to figure out when you have a new character added to the kit, how do you kind of make it more spicy and not just kind of just of, of the same note of the previous melee characters? Um, gear being somewhat similar, obviously, gear in this edge case, you, you find items at the moment, you'd, you go for a stage, you'd find a yellow item, you put it to your kit, and then you can use it when needed. Um, this one was not too crazy to set up as well. In terms of just looking back at things we borrowed, we knew that we can then just look at, okay, we've got throwable rocks, we've got throwable grenades at the moment, how can we add a new one? I mean, well, the context is a little bit different in this edge case. Obviously, we already know that obviously we had a barricade and stuff that we wanted to look into. So in this edge case, we just started figuring out, okay, Maybe if we want to do some blockage, can we try things such as like a tar grenade, where it's like, just goes back into the example before, if someone was to kind of walk into something and it kind of slowed them down, how would that feel? Um, so we obviously we just change the event hooks to make sure the rock and stuff would have something free for us to kind of brain them off. Um, you, can, you could totally just make it spawn like an inflatable guy if you really wanted to, so something to distract people, um, Metal Gear style. But just little things to kind of get a VFX thrown in there, a material decal at the floor that scales, and then just any quick audio feedback to really sell your idea, because it would be that thing where, once again, I could, I could show you this idea in terms of how Splatoon and such, such does it, but generally people can often quite get different takes from what you're trying to say in this kind of area. Just by letting them play around with these sort of things, lets them know like, oh, okay, okay, the shield can offer this, the, the grenade throw can offer this, and just, just feel it, and then they can just immediately just go online with our current temporary, uh, our temporary tests and play out the meta just then and there before we actually start looking into things for, um, um, onto our further secondary step which in turn became our slow burn grenade, which is, as I mentioned before, something that kind of burns at your ankle as you're kind of going through and slows you down and you're trying to navigate through, kind of bleeding people out. Uh, from these tests, obviously, we were able to actually figure out what we didn't like straight away. Um, it was actually really handy to let people know, like, okay, give us a play and they can just tell us directly, okay, maybe change this, change that up. Originally, the, the tar grenade itself would be more towards something that you'd actually, as I mentioned before, Actually, no, originally, sorry, the, the tar grenade was actually your, your super ability. Um, and then the, the barricade on your back was something you'd find, you'd accumulate onto your back, and it would change your moveset. But we then find out, actually, maybe flipping it made it a lot easier. Obviously, when it comes into the headaches of now having a, a physical barricade and putting it down, how about we just tie those systems together? We already have all those systems kind of mocked up. Why don't we just kind of mix them together and see how they feel? So this is the case we'd now make our our super be the super shield. You get enough ability meter, we already have the hook that lets us fire it off and see how it feels spawn a shield and see how it goes. And it was pretty sweet. It's that thing where you're generally trying to figure out with the, with the array of ideas that you have, how can you just kind of throw things to like, hey, what's your thoughts on this? Here's a function, give that a test. And anything that you have on the side that didn't make it through can now just be used for a secondary brainstorm for a later character. So you're still utilizing your kit and your, your, your movesets as well. Um, and this kind of goes into some closing main thoughts I, I actually want to jump into in terms of our, our characters themselves and just working with this, well, working amongst the team, trying to make sure everyone's ideas can be heard of how they can add more to this kit and just to, to uh, brainstorm amongst the team. The first thing is, obviously, time is valuable to try spot on um, what options you have and what tools you have. Um, you're not just throwing things out there to see what sticks straight away. You're discussing amongst the team to make people feel involved. Um, design, design decks and all these things that you're actually looking at, uh, collecting your archives and reasonings, these are still helpful. You want to make sure you're still writing up your design decks in, in these design roles. But you want to make sure people are actually are getting their voice heard. Um, so obviously, as I mentioned before, it's extremely vital to make sure you're, conver um, you're conversing between all disciplines to get your, your ideas out. Because obviously, if you pass your idea to one person, and then they're like, OK, this is cool, and they pass it to another person, something may have been lost along that way. So just trying to be more hands-on where you can to make sure everyone is available is really, really crucial and really vital if you can. Um, Literally understanding how any of your ideas, if you're, 
if you're trying to think of something where it's like an easy thing to say, would be like, hey, I want to bring this to the table, and then here's my research, and here's my, my percentage and such to kind of make sure it's going to be like foolproof. Obviously, things are never quite foolproof. So generally, figuring out how to break these down just back to the core and back to the, the core pillars itself is really, really vital as well. Um, so just trying to make sure you're actually discussing with your teams in this edge case, what do people need? Generally, when it comes to these things across different projects, what, what can people bring to the table without being locked into just one pathway? If, as I mentioned before, you have this idea for like the shield and it doesn't quite work out, maybe someone has something they can bounce off. Could they then take your prototype and then mock something out of it and then make something else to pitch back to the group? Even if they haven't got quite the skill set in terms of being able to code directly or maybe not be able to animate so much, they can just bring something to the table with the thing, our findings and our kits. Um, another major note I think is, as I said before, obviously communication is extremely key. Um, the notion of, obviously, if we're going to have more hands-on where it's like, if someone, obviously, you want to know who your specialists are, who you can refer to for advice. But if we're going to have people trying to be hands-on and wanting to figure things out, you don't want them to generally feel out of place. If someone generally is an animator and have a really good game design idea, they have a really good mission they want to play and such, it doesn't mean they, they're not able to. You want to make sure, I guess for a clean example, if you're going to have someone kind of brainstorm an idea of this new moveset, um, you don't want someone on your other team to then feel put out to be like, oh, well, well, if you're designing this, or if, if you're making this on your own, then what do I do? What can I do? That's generally something you want to try to avoid. You want to make sure everyone knows that everyone is vital to the team and everyone can bring the ideas to the table. Having a tech design title or generally being in this kind of situation where you may be multidisciplinary doesn't make you a one-man team. You need to actually know your limits as well. Um, outside strike teams, um, obviously, if people don't have that title, they may think like, oh, yeah, so this title means you can do X and Y, right? Does that mean those without the title can't do those? No, that's definitely not the case. It's generally trying to figure out amongst what your team is working on, how can you figure out what their needs are and how can you get them to the forefront of the discussions as well? Um, uh, a talented colleague of mine actually mentioned had actually really enjoying mechanic uh, gameplay explorations. Um, working in a different studio, they are currently on the art pathway. Obviously, they're looking at the art, just playing the environment and props and such. And there's been many a times where Jeremy would come to the table and be like, I, I, I want to, I, wanna ha I have an idea, but I don't know how to say it to. And it's kind of, you can almost see they almost just about get it, but kind of pull it back. So it's generally that thing where it's, it's nice that they can always have someone to discuss this with. So in this case, they come to me and say, like, I have this idea, can you pitch this for me? But rather than just passing the idea along down, like a, almost like a corporate line, like title to title and role to role, it's just trying to find ways to motivate them to let them know, like, hey, you have this idea, like you, brought, you thought of this idea, not me. I could, I could take the credit, but where would be the fun in this and where would that leave you in the grander scheme of things? So generally, just trying to motivate them to let them know like, no, no, this is a great idea. We, I'll, I'll come with you if you need to. We can discuss with this person. Um, I can help mock it up with, with you if you need to as well. Bring your idea to the table and then let's discuss as a group. Um, they don't need to feel back, held back by their, their title or their hierarchy. Just because they're not the same discipline doesn't mean you can't be involved in those talks and making sure we're all just making the game together or having fun with it. Um, I think one of those examples, actually, that um, also kind of sparked me was in the book Ask Iwata by um, the late president from Nintendo. It, it shows that even amongst a studio with such prestige, making such amazing titles, and they've, obviously we see the end product. We see how amazing, obviously, Super Mario 64 became, and obviously how that over the years became things like Mario Odyssey, Zelda the original from the NES become a Breath of the Wild. These are really amazing ideas and game products, but... Even these products have their worlds when it comes to people trying to make sure their, their ideas are heard. Um, I think one of the examples was when they were discussing with one of the earlier NES titles, hey, I, oh man, I, I really want to do this idea, it's really cool, but it's just, I don't think it's going to work. And just having just, a, just someone of a distant discipline, it doesn't even matter who, just kind of walked up to that person and was like, but do you want to do it? And then that kind of moment of pause, it's like, can, can, can I do it? And it's like, yeah, yeah, you can. And it's, it's a really good read. It's just a little extract of that of how Iwata himself was also trying to figure out, even with all this creative talent stuff, people are still people. They may not get your intention straight away. Some people may be a little bit too headstrong. Um, some people may be a little bit more kind of shy and kind of pulling back, or as I do all the time, I talk way too fast. But generally, it's that, that push just kind of let them feel motivated just to try things. Don't feel limited behind a job title or like, oh, if I, if I want people to respect me, I really need to run up a job ladder just so I can hit a, a higher title and then, and then I'm golden. No, it's, it's like even some of us, our amazing ideas come from literally graduate students who just come on because they're so passionate, they're so, so just wanting to like jump onto like, this is, this is a game I've played, it's really amazing. Even obviously discussing with people um, last night and people today, generally some indie products people are making, there's some really creative ideas out there. It's just 
oh, but before I get this idea, then I should, I should jump into this title first. Like, no, 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 just keep creating. Just keep sharing your ideas as you go. Generally, yes, it, it may help if you have a title. Obviously, the experience will help, obviously, if you've come to a job, but that shouldn't stop you from just brainstorming amongst your, amongst your peers and more so. Um, but yes, it's trying to make sure there's that, that spark to reignite for people. Um, looking at alternative means if you need to, but generally just trying to find a solution amongst anyone and everyone. We're all generally in this together, and we want to make sure we have this passion that we can keep fostering amongst this community. So let's explore it. Um, I also realize I'm really early, but either way, thank you very much for your time. Um, and I hope you guys just keep being awesome and keep being creative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan. I mean, there was a lot there. <laughs> it was absolutely Thank wonderful. Um, so we do have time for some questions, if anyone would like to, um, to come to the front. Oh, it's quite bright light, so I'm just seeing It's really hard to see, Okay, yeah. I can see people. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, mystery person. <laughs> right, I'm in a good spot, yes. Hello. There. Hello. Uh, first off, uh, I'd like to say, since you mentioned... Up until last Monday, I was doing LQA at Sega. So, hello. Hello. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Um, <laughs> it's been a while. My question would be, uh, since you started talking about getting to the fun as quick as possible, mm. I'd like to first ask the question and open it, open it up a bit. The question is, how, how would you balance logistics and development? The opening up is that, if you know the game GTFO, mm. The game gets into the meat of it immediately when you launch the game, right away. No UI, no nothing, you're in there, get it done. But according to Steam stats, an estimate, the estimate revenue of the game is 23 million. And then if you look at a game like Genshin Impact, which mm. made 2 billion in a year, or if you look at Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which the estimate revenue is $1 billion, mm. Those games hold your hand a lot. Mm -hmm. They take you everywhere the, in the Genshin Impact. You have the guide character. I forgot her name. Pylon, yeah. Pylon, yeah. They don't get you the, into the fun as fast as mm -hmm. GTFO does. So since that is your topic and you've made uh, Hood, Art Laws and Legends, mm -hmm. I return back to the question, how would you balance logistics and development? Ooh, so that's a tricky one. I guess there's two sides to it. There is the, the fun for, obviously, your development studio, just trying to make sure they know, like, hey, it's not all just, like, obviously, the corporate work we, we still got to do, but you can just start brainstorming and jumping in quickly at ASAP. Um, but when it comes to the actual gameplay itself, I think that then goes into just the, the actual onboarding experience, which is it's a, bigger, a bigger topic there. I think when it comes into it, as, as I mentioned before, we have a... Generally, when it comes to brainstorming how you welcome people into the, the initial moments of your game, obviously, first impressions, as said, obviously, in the presentation as well, is a major key. Generally, when it comes into the onboarding setup, you'd have your, you'd have your, your clear needs of the things you need to showcase to players to let them know where they can go. But a lot of this, actually, I think, obviously, it differ differs from game to game, obviously. Live service, like Genshin Impact, versus like a closed-off story game. But even a closed-off story game, like um, in the set's case, we have our, our Assassin's Creed, became more open-world and sandboxy. Um, so with those in mind, a lot of it just goes into what are the things we want the players to feel, in this edge case being the case of exploration. So I think when it comes to getting to the fun as quick as possible, I think games like Breath of the Wild, which obviously um, Genshin is very, very similar to, and Elden Ring does a great way of it where we have our shopping list, we want you to know, we, we need to teach you this. Um, so obviously I'd be like how to like, interact with things, how to get through doors and so on and so forth. But when it comes into the, the greater exploration of things, a lot of it is... A lot of it goes into level design. Obviously, we can we can frame things. We have our weenies, which is like the giant towers and distance. Like you know, like you you could go this way, or you can go this way. And we can kind of try funnel you towards like a, a safe opening area. Um, obviously, if things feel too tricky going the other way, we can try to guide you back. So you kind of loop around yourself. A lot of that is generally like in this edge case of say Elden Ring. Those pathways aren't obviously they aren't direct actual linear pathways. It's more like open areas. But those paths generally are trying to tick box you towards these kind of things that you want to experience early on rather than later. Unless you intend you want to be hard and hardcore like Elder Ring and literally put a giant boss in front of you straight away. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, that is the kind of thing where obviously we know in terms of our, our design list, our shopping list, we know we want the player to interact with X, find Y, experience this and that. And that would essentially be, in, in some ways, it's just, it ultimately is trying to get you invested early in this feeling of exploration. You found a treasure chest, awesome. Oh, you found a grace, what does that do? Um, and obviously, the, the more looking to further design side would be obviously this goes towards sunk costs as well, where it's like yes. 
Um, obviously, it's Ghost Wars. A lot of mobile games do this, where they want to make sure, yes, it's as exciting as possible, lots of flashy colors, but we genuinely want you to feel like you've hit that main loop as quick as possible. So that would be, in this edge case, uh, Genshin Impact, Paimon will guide you from A to B. You can freely like, turn left when Monster the city to the right. Um, but generally, once you kind of go through the city, it's like, well, cool, we're going to need some backup to fight the dragon. Do, do a temple. And that temple of characters genuinely feels that like acceleration because it's, it's free. You can just jump in. It's like, oh, these characters are my characters. These heroes are my heroes. And together, we want to take down that dragon. So it generally got the player to that point as quick as possible. So they're like, when's my next moment? I can gather a new group of heroes to fight a new boss sort of thing. Um, and that, that generally, all, all that just comes down to just looking at your, your, the requirements you're trying to meet the player. Again, it, it changes based on what game you're looking at. But generally, you're trying to figure out if this is the thing we want the player to fill, how ca quick can we do it? But how can we make sure we don't overwhelm them as well? I want to make sure we kind of pace it out and say, really appreciate this is a key thing I want to explore. And this is another key thing I want to explore. I, I guess, like, in this one last example of the Genshin thing, exploring your, your temples, trying to get those characters so you can feel really lush like, with new movesets, which is brilliant. But I don't think it quite stops you to kind of explore so much of the artifacts. So that, this in this case would just be your, your gear grinding and stuff. That system is extremely deep. And I think maybe it's so deep it may put off people, so they actually leave that to the back burner. So that onboarding setup is something that will push to the, the, the delay side, essentially. Let the player discover that on their own. And now you have this other side of onboarding where sometimes it's good to not teach everyone something. Let them figure it out. Mm -hmm. Generally, like, I'll intentionally withhold that information. Obviously, maybe a little, little breadcrumbs here and there, but once they kind of click, oh, these two things do a thing, and then they kind of just start diving deep into and exploring. Um, I hope that answers your question. A lot of it is obviously it's very sort of, no. um, different areas in that, kind of, in that kind of side. I'd say that was pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bro. Thank you for that. No, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I better leave. <laughs> <I've got laughs> a lot of people. Cheers. Okay, I think we only have time for just one more quick oh, okay. question, um, but um, Nathan will be around in the break as well. Yes. Hi. Uh, what's your top tip for those just starting with game development? Ooh, game development. I mean, it's it's a tricky one. I think I kind of touched on something I may have actually missed just before as well, where game dev, obviously the industry is really large. There's so many different specialist routes you can go and such. Um, when it comes to just getting in, I think a lot of it is essentially just mainly the community, just discussing with people. Obviously, in one route, it can be towards more of a, an indie studio where it's like you may be doing multiple disciplines. So I, that's why I, why I personally use the word game dev because I'm not specifically saying like designer or whatnot. You may be doing multiple things, just where, where devs, where developers. But obviously, if you're going towards more towards like a, doing, you want to do QA, which is a whole, a whole deep area in itself, functionality testing, or you want to do um, obviously art and animation, which are all obviously completely diff diff um, deep, different areas. Getting into it and generally trying to make sure you find a, a good footing is, I mean, technically you're doing it. You're here. It's just meeting the right people and discussing and generally just being involved. Um, I think it was a little bit difficult for me because, as I said before, I, I get anxious and I stutter a lot. So I usually kind of pull back just trying to put myself forward just to kind of discuss with people what, what, what ideas we have and just brainstorm. Um, but when it comes into, obviously, just getting into it, there would be, there's a side of actually getting a position, which I'd say is plenty of ways, just like obviously you can apply online, obviously there's graduate position itself. But in terms of actually starting up a project, like I want to start developing something. Um, yes, I think that's where it's definitely looking into your community and trying to make sure like, okay, what things, well, what things do you really want to do? And what things do you really want to bring to the table? And trying to figure out where are those people? Those people, it's really hard to gauge at some point, but all around you, generally like when it comes to, Obviously, early on, we had to talk about make the game with bananas and physics bananas. And obviously, you're generally hearing it, that's getting that kind of that spark out of people. It's like, that's actually pretty funny. And obviously, we heard Nidhogg pop up. Just trying to figure out if that's something that you generally find interesting, like talk to those people. Like, try like look into that idea further and just kind of brainstorm with people. Um, like, no, no idea is silly. No idea is dumb. It's just trying to brainstorm your, your projects with people. And I think going from that footing where you generally know you're making something you want to make is a really, really solid start. But yes, it's definitely just discussing with people, brainstorming and such. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan, for thank a you. fantastic start to the afternoon. Thank you.